a lot of stuff for one night. And I picked a topic that's really easy to deal with. EPM, right? This is uh, the many faces of EPM. I don't know why my slide's up so high, uh, but I selected, do you like that bottom picture in the middle? For anybody who's from Florida and has ever worked with Dr. Rob Mackay, that's Dr. Mackay down there, uh, one of our interns gave me that picture of him. But anyway, when, when you look at EPM, it can look at a, like a lot of things. And so I thought I'd start off with a case example. So here we have a three-year-old uh, thoroughbred gelding and the primary complaint, they were riding the horse in a clinic on the weekend and he was dragging the toes of the pelvic limbs. So this is Dr. Ruggles over here on the right. He gets in the way of the video, but it'll be okay. At any rate, so here's the horse jogging. Uh, Brent uh, Comer was our medicine tech. Um, he did a lot to save the life of a thoroughbred mare named Rachel Alexander. Alexandra, and so now he works for Stone Street. They tired him away. So at any rate, here's the horse. History was dragging the toes. Um, this is on, that was on a weekend. This is Monday, right before Thanksgiving. And so you can see Dr. Rugg was looking at him. The horse is a little bit lame in the left pelvic limb. So the, the horse showed lame left pelvic limb. Dr. Ruggles started blocking him. He blocked him up to just below the hock. Horse was now lame in the right front. He blocked the right front foot. The horse was almost normal, but he still didn't look quite right. So I did a neuro exam on him. So first and foremost, uh, right as the horse first starts to walk, it kind of paces. You see that it's moving both legs on the same side sort of simultaneously. Now, over time, it, it got to a point where it wasn't doing that. If you watch it, uh, during the exam, we'll notice that uh, it drags the toes of the pelvic limbs, but you, you know, I don't know about you, but neurologically, this horse doesn't look too bad. You know, it's, it's not making a ton of mistakes. When we elevate the head to take away the horizon, trying to make the horse be, uh, so it has to, have uh, that unconscious awareness of where its feet are. It makes a few more mistakes. You can see sometimes it'll throw the outside pelvic limb a little wider. Uh, and you can see that left pelvic limb toe is worn off there. Walking, it's not a big hill, but just walking them up and down a little hill. Uh, you'll be able to see that sometimes it, it, it shows some signs even in the thoracic limbs. Flips the feet out just a little bit more. Again, when you and I go up and down the stairs, we don't think the risers are six inches high. We know where our feet are unconsciously. So this horse ought to know where its feet are. When we elevate the head, it makes it a little bit, you know, show a few more signs. Okay, so here's, just to reiterate, ridden in a clinic on the weekend, came to us on Monday, had a little bit of lameness. Um, we did the uh, neurologic exam and it made a few subtle little neurologic mistakes. But, you know, it didn't, it wasn't real easy. We didn't know the cause of it, so since the horse was subtle enough, we recommended, why don't you go ahead and ride the horse another 10 to 14 days, see if the lameness is gonna become more obvious. So, six days later, the owner called me, she was panicked. Horse is down and can't get up. So here's Albert when he came back to us. And um, so it, it six days after that, what we saw, okay, and then I am not being terribly mean to him, but I did encourage him to get up with my knees. He got up and, and uh, stood there, made Brent very happy. Now look at him when he walked outside. So we did some other diagnostics to make sure he wasn't a wobbler, checked him for herpes, we did blood and CSF, and at the early exam, we got a very, very weak positive on that testing, um, you know, but the, the very first time I saw him, this time when he came back in, now he's strong positive in both his blood and his CSF. He had EPM. How far did it go? Well, that was in, uh, that was a few years ago, it was before the WEG was in Lexington, at around Thanksgiving time. This was the following September because the owner came back to work at WEG and so she brought him back. 
She had rehabilitated him, and so here he is. Um, we'll see a little bit of him lunging. And, and, you know, whilst he wasn't perfect yet, you know, he had made a tremendous amount of improvement. You'll see when she's riding him, I thought he still paced just a little bit, you know, and maybe was a little bit weak. But he, he made a lot of improvement. And so I, I chose this case because it, it just tells us, you know, here's a disease that literally is something that in the 26 years I spent at Ohio State, I spent a lot of time researching this. Even since I've come to Root Middle for 10 years, I continue to do a lot of research with the folks at the University of Kentucky. This is an important disease, and even though starting back in the 60s we called it segmental myelitis, and we've learned a lot about it, there are lots of issues that remain. This is such a complicated disease for us. And it's complicated that Albert showed all of the scenarios of it. It showed how difficult it is to diagnose. He showed how you can treat him as aggressively as possible and they might respond to treatment. He continued to relapse over and over. Uh, you know, over the next 18 months, I followed this horse and he would get better, then he would get bad again. And we finally ended up losing him. And uh, so, you know, but again, it, it's such an important disease that we all see. And so, you know, here are the, the key things about it. When you see the organism in cell culture, it looks pretty ataxic itself. So you can imagine when it gets into the horse's nervous system, it's going to uh, make them be uh, fairly clumsy. What, what do we know about this? Well, it's a protozoan, and uh, it has some things that are conserved for a long time, these little apicoplasts are uh, conserved things from uh, plants, actually. And so triazines, uh, some of those medications that we use might be like uh, herbicides, like atrazine or something that we actually can use. So there are, there are a lot of things we know about it. What are the big three questions that we need to know about EPM? Is there a best test? Well, the thing that I think is whatever diagnostic test your veterinarian chooses to use, I think the questions that you should ask is, how was the test validated? So you need to know, uh, number one, how was the test validated? Number two, have they started with a neurologic exam? It's really important to know that the horse has neurologic signs. If you do this test on normal horses, certainly if they live in a state that has possums, and we'll see why that's important in a minute, sometimes as many as 80 to 100% of the horses on a given farm can have antibodies in their bloodstream. That means they've been exposed. But uh, only less than 1% of them actually show the neurologic signs. So uh, what are the tests that are available? Well, these are the labs. Equine Diagnostic Solutions is one in Lexington. Uh, Neogen has a, is a, a diagnostic uh, lab that's available nationwide, uh, as is IDEX, and then University of California at Davis. And then there's a lab here in Florida called Pathogenes, that looks for surface antigens on these protozoans. Uh, is there a best treatment? This is obviously a Photoshop because that's California chrome and there's a possum on the racetrack. So we know somebody photographed him. But the bottom line is it's really important to know that if a horse is living in a location that has possums, they have a very high probability of getting exposed. So what are the treatments that are out there that, that have been around for a while? Well. There's, for more than 40 years, the initial treatment was this drug combination of uh, pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. So the pyrimethamine is an anti-malarial drug. So if you or I are going somewhere where they have malaria, they're likely to start you on that treatment before you go as a prevention. Uh, but it also can kill these protozoans. Um, and it acts by inhibiting folic acid. So it's gonna inhibit a B vitamin uh, is the way that's going to act. The other drugs, the triazines, one's called Marquis or Panazaril, and the other is called Diclazaril or Protozil. So those are the two FDA-approved products that are out there available for it. So Panazaril, Diclazaril, Sulfadiazine, Pyrimethamine are FDA-approved products. They show 60% improvement 
Um, you know, and the horses should improve one to two grades. The rationale for treatment duration, all of them when they got tested were done by a neuro exam uh, with blood and CSF showing that they had signs, they had antibodies, they were treated, and in order for it to be a successful treatment, the horse had to improve one grade and hold that improvement for 90 days with no other drugs. That's what FDA called a success. And so that's how all the drugs that were out there that are currently FDA approved were approved. Um, there are some other unlabeled drugs that Toltrazero or Baycox gets used a lot. One pass through the liver and this drug becomes Panazaril. So the metabolite of Toltrazerol is marquee, okay? So, so a lot of people use this drug. It's, it's uh, not an FDA approved drug, but you'll see a lot of people that are utilizing it. Certainly the big concern about it is sometimes when there have been compounded drugs, and this is a horse that had a, a compounded drug, and actually this occurred in Florida, and there were some horses that had some toxic side effects, including seizures. So there are, or there are uh, potential for complications. Um, the coquinate is a drug that is getting investigated currently. Um, right now, you could get it as decoxm, so it's a cox anti-coccidial, another anti-protozoal drug that's used for treatment of uh, food animals, so calves and, and sheep. This is a product that's probably gonna go away as are all a lot of those over-the-counter uh, uh, coccidia stats, but it, it will probably be available as a, uh, uh, a drug that you can do by prescription. Uh, but at any rate, there is some work going on on this. Right now, you could utilize it uh, as the decox. Other things that we might wanna do are what can we do to turn on the horse's immune system? Because remember when I talked about Albert, some of the things that we don't know on that unknown questions about EPM, some of those things include, is the organism more virulent? Some strains are different than others. What about the horse's immune system? Some horses have a really, really good protective immune system, others don't. So there are lots of things that might lead to whether or not they, uh, they work. And so anything that we might do to also enhance the immune system in a product that's getting a lot of press lately has been levamisol. There are a lot of people who have been using it. It's getting combined a little bit with the decox or decoquinate. Um, what, what are the things that are important? Uh, when we start looking out, I got two more slides. The old treatments that we developed like 15 to 20 years ago, I, I don't know. If we repeated all of those studies, I'm not sure that we would get that 60% cure rate. I personally think we might get 70 to 80% because I'm guessing that our diagnostic testing is better now and I think we'd be better at giving real cases. So in other words, do I think that some of the horses that were used that were called successes maybe didn't really have EPM? I worry about that. So I'd like to see us repeat that, although we have these three FDA approved drugs, I hope none of them go away. I do think that we have to, you know, avoid excessive use of the drugs. There are some standard bred race horses that can't race without being on an antiprotozoal drug. They swear that it, it makes a difference in how they perform. The last thing is how do we prevent this disease? Whilst I was at Ohio State, we spent a lot of time working with the Fort Dodge Company, working very hard to develop a vaccine. If it was easy to make a vaccine, against a protozoal drug, malaria wouldn't be such a worldwide problem. It's a huge problem, and so it's not easy to make vaccines. But at any rate, the, the, there is, right now what some people do is they administer the medications, some people give them for the first week out of each month, and uh, that will, we, we know that that will keep the protozoans out of the GI tract. If they're not in the GI tract, they're not gonna go from there into the central nervous system. So. Uh, but in any event, we are still looking at, and now with newer technologies, it may very well be that a new vaccine will be developed. A lot of stuff to say in a, in a, a very short time period, uh, but I, I think the most important thing is the way we're gonna continue to answer questions about this disease is understanding the organisms, 
I, sell, I talk almost all about S. neurona. There are two bugs that we know cause it. Sarcocystis neurona has been the one that most people see. There is a Neospora. So Neospora husei is another protozoan. We know the life cycle of S. neurona. It's the definitive host is the possum. There are multiple intermediate hosts, including cats, armadillos, skunks, raccoons. All of those are intermediate hosts. Possums are scavengers. They will eat anything. So if you have on your property an intermediate host that dies, get rid of it, bury it, dispose of it, because the possum is going to get infected by ingesting that. And um, I think I've gone long enough, but if you want to make some vet students really upset, you maintain a colony of raccoons, <laughs> and you make them bleed those raccoons, and then you uh, harvest the parts of the raccoons, and you then infect possums, and then you harvest the intestine of those possums, and get the organism, and then you feed it to horses, and we can induce the disease. So we know that we can, we can reproduce this disease, but nonetheless, we still don't know everything that we need to know about this particular disease. What, any questions? Okay, vitamin E probably doesn't play any role in EPM, but vitamin E as an antioxidant plays a huge role in protecting the nervous system. So most of the horses that have a neurologic disease, whether it be equine degenerative myelopathy, which we know is related to uh, a genetic problem in quarter horses where they don't uh, have a good ability to absorb vitamin E, to wobblers or, or spinal cord trauma, almost every horse that you see me treating, it wouldn't be a surprise to have vitamin E as a part of that treatment. But it's mostly, uh, it's gonna have an adjunctive effect. I think that's a really good point. So the point that she's making is there are some neurologic diseases in particular. There are two that we know of. One is called equine degenerative myelopathy, and that affects proprioceptive relay tracts in the nervous system. So those tracts that tell the limbs where they are, talk to the brain, some of them are unconscious awareness, the ones that you know just allow you and I to know where our feet are when we move. There's another one called equine motor neuron disease. This is a disease that looked like it was going to be a model for Lou Gehrig's disease. So there was a lot of effort put into that. So it affects a different part of the nervous system. Uh, it affects the nerves that are coming off the spinal cord. And so the clinical signs are gonna be the hallmark of that disease is weakness, 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 followed by muscle atrophy. And vitamin E can affect both of those disorders, can be a part of treatment. Well, I, if you have more, do we have time for one more question or not? All right. That, that's a really good question. So the question had to do with what about the use of folic acid? You remember one of those drugs that I talked about was pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. And the way that drug acts is it inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. So it's going to reduce, it's going to kill the protozoan by making them unable to have an adequate amount of folic acid. So a lot of people, when they're treating the horse with EPM, want to protect the horse, okay? So they want to damage the protozoan with the medications but protect the horse, so they give them folic acid. I'm not a big folic acid user. I'm certainly not overly critical. You say you've been doing it for 20 years. There's plenty of good justification for that. Here's why, this is my logic. In order for folic acid to be active in the horse, it has to be converted to folinic acid. 
To be converted to folinic acid, it requires dihydrofolate reductase. It requires the enzyme that you're inhibiting. So I think you might actually have the potential to, to make things a little bit worse in those cases. So I, I, I don't always use it. What I do do, though, is I check to see if they're getting in uh, folic acid problems by seeing if the horse develops anemia. If they start to get anemic, I stop the treatment and then I give them folinic acid. So it's already converted to the active form and it's going to treat that complication because there are some, some pro, uh, programs where horses have been on treatment for a long, long time that they get severe anemia. And in fact, there are a couple of papers out there where foals are born that have folic acid deficiencies and so that they're really, really some significant complications, like the foals are born with no skin or partial. It, it, so, so there are potential toxins you know, associated with that. Administering folic acid is not a wrong decision. I'm just telling you why I don't usually do it. We better move on to the last prequel. Thanks so much.